All right. Uh, so yeah, like you said, I'm Craig. Uh, I currently work at DWP um, as an interaction designer. Um, and yeah, I'd like to start off by saying like I don't have a disability yet. Uh, the reason why I say yet is because the prevalence of disability rises with age. Six percent of children uh, are living with a disability. Sixteen percent of working age adults are living with a disability, and forty-five percent of people who are over state pension age, like that's almost half. Um, so yeah, the probability of developing a disability goes up exponentially the older you get. So people living with a disability are far more common than you might have realized. Um, it's actually 11.9 million people in, well, 11.9 million adults in the UK. That's one in five people or 20%. But how does it affect digital products? Like in 2017, there was only 22% of adults who are living with a disability who'd said they'd never used the internet. So that's roughly like, it's 2.6 million people that don't use the internet. Everyone else like does. So with that in mind, like this is like potentially 9.3 million people that are living with a disability trying to use the apps and the websites and stuff that you've built, or potentially 9.3 million people that can't buy things off your site or whatever if you haven't made them accessible. And I think the problem is, is when we think of a disability, we often think like of a wheelchair, but there's so many that are less obvious, like it can make us ignorant. And I think a lot of the reason is that this is the... The rec well, the internationally recognized symbol for like disabled people. But disabilities and impairments aren't the same. So an impairment might disable you, but they're not the same thing, which is why the, the that disability icons are like a bit confusing. Like, you know, it just kind of says it's like a, a one catch all and you might not need a wheelchair. It doesn't really take everyone into account. Uh, there's been some work done recently by, let me get this right. So Basically, yeah, there's, this logo on the right is being sort of taken up by activists who are kind of sticking it over the top of other ones and stuff, and it shows the person in a much more accessible state, like they're more independent, they're moving themselves around rather than the one on the left that's kind of just sat there, you know, waiting to be pushed around. Um, people are kind of sticking these all over the place. It's accessibleicon.org sells stickers and stencils, so you can kind of join the movement. I think the idea is that you're supposed to do your own property. I don't think you, like, I'm not by any means <laughs> recommending you to go out and start like sticking them all over the place. But if you want to kind of do that sort of stuff, go for it. But yeah, so an impairment and a disability like aren't the same thing. Like what is the difference? So an impairment is like medical. That's the thing. Um, it's the condition or symptom that the person experiences. So, you know, um, it's the part of your body that might not work properly. Uh, you know, if you've got glaucoma, your eyes might not work properly, so you've got a visual impairment. Um, but it's important to remember like, that if you've got an impairment, it doesn't necessarily mean you're disabled. A uh, disability is considered when a person finds it difficult to perform everyday tasks to a level that's considered normal for most people. So this is when you can't perform the task that you otherwise would be able to do. Um, so again, going back to the visual impairment, um, you know, you might get around just fine, but if the only way that you can get around is to drive, then all of a sudden you're disabled. So that is the that is a really important thing to take away is that um, a person with an impairment doesn't always consider themselves to be disabled. Uh, so for example, if you imagine you're a wheelchair user and you want to get a book from the library. So your house is all set up, you know, all the benches are low enough, You've got enough space to move around, turn around in, you get up, you make your breakfast, whatever. Uh, you leave the house, you've got a ramp installed outside, so you know you let yourself down the ramp and onto the street. You get to the crossings, all of the things are mounted low, you can hit the buttons, you know, you can get down the curbs, up the curbs, everything's dead easy. And then all of a sudden you get to the library and it looks like this. So there's no, you know, there's no wheelchair ramp, there's no lift, there's no buzzer to alert everyone. Like all of a sudden now you are disabled. Whereas if the library had looked like this, you could have rolled right in, got your book and been on your way. So people aren't always disabled by their impairments. They're in disabled by poorly designed environments. Um, and that's just whatever environment it is they have to operate in. So it might not always be a physical space, like it can be a digital space. So your app, your website, your online service, these are all environments in which these people have to operate. And it's our job as designers and developers to make sure that they're able to do that. 
Example two is, you know, imagine you're colorblind and you want to check how well a team is playing before placing a bet. So, you know, you might want to stick an accumulator on at the weekend or something and you want to have a look at how well the team's performing. Uh, you can, this is a, a popular sports website. Uh, it has changed now, but this was like an, an old slide. But, um, you know, you go here and you go, oh, okay, right, Manchester City, they've drawn one, won four, like they look like a pretty safe bet. But the problem is, like, you're colorblind, so all of a sudden everything kind of starts to look the same. And if you're red and green colorblind, you can't tell the difference between a loss and a, and a win. Like, you can still pick the draws out, but the other ones, it's, you know, you've got no idea of the form of that team. Um, like I said, the, this website's now changed. It was BBC Sport. They've now just switched it to a W for a win and an L for a draw. And all of a sudden, now, even if you can't see the colors, you can still kind of use it. And it's just little things like that that you might not think of that you need to kind of start thinking of. If uh, you're interested in kind of running these simulations, there is a Mac app called Sim Daltonism, which is really good, which just opens a window up and you can just drag it over the top and actually see if your design still makes sense. Uh, there's also Funkify, which is a Chrome plugin. Uh, and Photoshop itself's got built-in filters where you can just kind of proof your work through these filters just to kind of make sure that you're not leaving anyone out who may have these impairments. Um, so yeah, basically accessibility should be designed in from the start, like it shouldn't be an afterthought and it, and it so often is. If you don't design it in from the start, you often end up with a solution that's not fit for purpose, which leaves you with something like this, um, where they've kind of went, oh, you know, this isn't accessible, so we'll have a wheelchair ramp and you can just come in and ask us to get it. And it's like, yeah, so when you're sat outside, you can just go in, get the ramp, whatever. So this is another example where, <laughs> you know, they haven't thought about it from the start. And again, they've just kind of went, okay, this person needs a wheelchair ramp. Let's just stick a one on the outside. And this is so often what happens with apps and websites and stuff where you just try and shoehorn it in at the end is you kind of end up with something that's sort of accessible, but, you know, you haven't, it's a clunky solution, basically. So again, if, even if we're thinking about accessibility, implementing it without talking to any users can be disastrous. Um, so even if you're starting to consider this stuff, you still need to talk to these people and you still need to test with these people. This is Robson Square in Vancouver. Uh, this always gets kind of pulled up and if ever you look up like good accessibility because they go, oh, yeah, they, they've built a ramp into the stairs and it kind of works for everyone. Um, but it's kind of an, it's an example of thinking about accessibility from the start, but not necessarily talking to the people that have to use it. Because if you talk, well, there's a lot of stuff online that basically says this isn't fit for purpose because the ramp's too steep. So you're supposed to have a 1 to 16 gradient, uh, and this is about a 1 to 12. So basically the ramp's supposed to be a certain elevation and it's too steep. So if you're coming down, you end up going way too fast. And if you lose control, you're into the wall or you're down the stairs. Also, there's no handrails down the side. So if you fall sideways, you're down the stairs. Uh, and also if you're trying to go up the ramp, the, the distances are quite long on quite a high elevation, so it gets quite tiring. And obviously, if you get halfway up and you're too tired, do you reverse back down at like 30 mile an hour? Like it's, <laughs> it's not, it's not an ideal solution, but it's an example. You know, or we'll build it in, but not talk to any users about it. So yeah, and and this is the thing: is as designers, we don't normally make things inaccessible on purpose. It's just a lack of awareness or foresight. Um, we often focus on making things look pretty or making things look cool, and we often, because of that, we kind of leave people out without meaning to. Um, this is an example in King's Cross. So King's Cross Station had a, a recent overhaul. Um, and you can see here, like, a, a designer has obviously went, oh, like, this black strip would probably look cool if we just made it a big rectangle. But they've totally missed the point of why that window was so low in the first place. So now... You know, this poor person sat here having like, you know, no, it's it's a bit degrading, whereas if they'd have just left the sticker off the window in the first place, like it would have been much better. But it's, you know, it, on the surface, it looks more balanced and it looks a bit better, but you've kind of missed the point, I think. And sometimes as designers, we do that just because we're like, oh, this would look cooler or whatever. So sometimes as well, we try and make things better and we can actually make stuff worse. And... This is an example from, from DWP. This is, a, this is a real example of what happened, but I've kind of just replicated it again for the talk because we don't have the original footage from the research session because of 
GDPR and whatnot. But basically what happened was um, this is the standard date pattern for GovUK services. We asked for it in three boxes, sometimes give some help text, whatever. Um, and what we had in, in research was somebody was, you know, putting, people were putting September in the box. Um, so they were trying to put it in. That, that's totally fine. But they were getting a validation error and it was saying, well, enter a valid month. And it's like, well, September is a valid month. You just haven't put it in in the format that we were expecting it to be. So we were just like, oh, well, you know, we can do some clever stuff here. We can just, if the month is equal to September, change it to nine and we'll just deal with it on the back end. So, you know, we just let them put in September and we worked out on the back end that we wanted it to be a nine and then all was sort of well. And then we tested with a Dragon user. Um, and Dragon's a, it's software that lets you talk commands in plain English. So you can just talk to your computer. So you can say things like click continue and it'll look for something on the screen that says continue and click it. Uh, the thing is with Dragon is it's smart and sometimes it's a bit too smart. So it's kind of important that you mark your HTML up correctly. So basically Dragon kind of knows the difference between different inputs. So if you're looking for, if you've got a text input, it's going to try and put text in the box. If you've got a number field, it's going to go, well, I can't put text in that, so I'm going to put numbers in. Um, and this is what happened based on the changes that got made when you then try to run it through Dragon. So um, is this going to, oh, there. So yeah, in this research session, basically somebody took attempt after attempt to get through. And it's in this example, like I've just kind of went back and, and done it a lot faster. Like this was like getting validation errors and all sorts, like it was a really drawn out process. And it is an example of kind of trying to fix something and then making something else worse. And obviously if we hadn't have tested that, then we would have ended up in a situation where people might not have ever been able to get through because it was right oh nine in the box. So yeah, it's really important that you test your products with those people that use it. Um, and anytime you change something, like you kind of need to go through the process again. And it seems really kind of laborious, but you know, just, just by changing that one thing, which we thought was a, a minimal change, like we, it had a massive knock on effect. So this is kind of like an ongoing thing. So yeah, um, getting people on board is hard. So this is this is one of the things that comes out a lot about accessibility is like people just kind of say they don't have the time or the budget to do it. Um, and it is really hard to get people on board, but where I work, it's it's quite easy because it's the law. Like um, all public web uh, sector websites and apps need to be accessible by 2021. So let me just read the actual, cause so basically um, websites created after the 23rd of September, 2018 will need to comply with the requirements by 2019. Uh, ones created before 23rd of tw September, 2018 need to comply by 2020 and apps need to comply with the requirements by 2021. So basically if you work in government like me, like if you don't do this stuff, you're gonna be in real trouble, but obviously that isn't going to filter through to the private sector for a, a, a while longer. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing this stuff. It just means you're probably going to get less of a tell off not doing it. So yeah, one of the things that's really good is just to try empathy building exercises with your team. Um, these are like some activities that we've sort of done with our team and, and you know, you can do lunch and learn sessions and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the things that our user researcher did uh, is talk about lip reading and stuff. So people who are deaf, um, a lot of the time when they're going to things, people kind of assume they can lip read or, you know, they might ask, can you lip read? And it's really difficult to actually lip read. Um, some people can do it, but it's really hard to do accurately. And you should never assume that people can lip read and not al offer an alternative. So um, there's some really good posters actually that you can get from Deaf Awareness where it's just kind of sort of common practice if you're communicating with somebody who's deaf. So, you know, don't mumble and don't cover your mouth and that sort of thing. Um, but we do this all the time. People always mumble or, you know, you might be sat at your desk talking behind your hand or something like that. And it's just kind of, you know, 
be more aware when there's somebody there with that impairment. But this is the, so this is Malcolm. He's a user researcher out where I work. Um, this is a, this is an exercise you can do just like with your team, just to kind of prove how hard this is. Malcolm's um, going to mouth some words and you have to try and guess what it is that he's mouthing. So, so anyone got any ideas? So on one he's saying chair and on one he's saying share. So yeah, straight away we got all sorts of different things. Um, same thing again, this is Becky. She is a designer working on Get Your State Pension. She's gonna do the same thing. Six. Talent and salad. And one more, this is James Gordon who was actually sat over there. Um, this one's really difficult because the beard like takes away all the, <laughs> the face shape. But yeah, he's actually saying colorful and I love you. So yeah, as you can see, so you know, if if you can, I'm gonna leave this on here for a while. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> so yeah, lip reading's difficult. Basically, you should never assume that people can do it accurately. Um, this is these down here that I was on about. Um, this is a pack of simulation glasses. There's like eight different sets in there, and they come with a book. And they, each one kind of simulates different impairments. So one of them, um, you've got like tunnel vision, you've got macular de degeneration, where it's just kind of like all your vision's broken up. Um, and we did a lunch. So this is some of my team kind of doing this thing. We had printouts of like poems and stuff. And you had to wear different glasses and try and read the poems. Um, and we had an exercise. We, you know, there's an exercise where you can put a poster on a wall and see if once somebody can get to the poster, often they need to be escorted to the poster. And then you see people trying to read it and they're literally like this far away trying to read it because you just kind of, until you put them on, it's quite daunting to kind of realize how hard some of these things are. Um, so obviously if you've got like font sizes on your website and stuff that you can't scale up, you're kind of not taking these things into consideration. Um, we've also got a load of posters in government which were done by... Um, the Home Office, I had to try and think about that one there, make sure I got the right upon, but the Home Office have churned some posters out and these have been really popular. I think they've been translated into like 22 languages or something now. Um, and these are just like some, you know, do's and don'ts of designing for a screen reader, low vision, dyslexia. There's like a load of different ones. Uh, these are quite good to have up around the workplace, but also if you're a designer, then they're really good just to kind of have to refer to whilst you're designing some stuff. Um, so they'll say things like, designing for users on the autistic spectrum, do write in plain language, don't use figures of speech. So things like rain and cats and dogs, some people on the autistic spectrum take it quite literally, like they don't understand, they're like, what do you mean it's rain and cats and dogs? That makes no sense. They try and take it quite literally. And also like for people where English might not necessarily be their first language, if you start using idioms and stuff like that, they don't always get the context. And that brings me on to like this example. So this is a, this is a website called Kidly. Um, I'd went on to order, my friend had had a baby and I was like looking for a gift and I ended up on this website and then I kind of forgot about buying the gift and just went into like, I ended up writing a blog post on how horrendous the error messages were. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically like, uh, there's a lot wrong with this example, such as like the error messages are under the box. So if you're on a screen reader and the page refreshes and all your error messages are there, you don't know what's wrong with it until you get past the box, if that makes sense. You've got to kind of go past it and go out, and the recipient name, and then go back up the page. So that's a bit of a thing. But more was this. Like, this really bugged me. Like, oops, you forgot to pop in your number. Don't be shy. And I was like, yeah, but I wasn't shy. I just didn't put it in because I didn't want your crap marketing. Um, <laughs> and also, like, don't be shy. Like, I'm trying to buy a kid's present for my friend. Like, I'm not on Tinder. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it just it, it made no sense to me anyway. Um, and I guess the takeaway point from this is just make, make your content like simple, like don't use idioms, don't use Tinder slang, whatever that is. Um, and also like this, so this is wave, um, you might know of wave, but basically if you can't get people on board and you can't get budget for all of this stuff or whatever, at the bare minimum, just run your code through something like wave where, you know, it'll pick up whether you've got contrast errors, it'll pick up 
clangers, basically. It isn't going to tell you if it's usable, um, but it's going to tell you if you've got anything in there that would prevent you getting anything from a, a meaningful research session. So it's better if you don't rely on just Wave, like running through Wave and go, oh, it's accessible. Like you still, it's you need to test it with users, but this will stop you going out to a research session, sitting it in front of a user, and then having absolute howlers in there that you could have ironed out beforehand. And yeah, that's just the takeaway point. It's like these tools, these glasses, these lip reading exercise or whatever, they're really good to build empathy. Like once you've had somebody wander around with the glasses on and have no idea what they're doing, they've got a bit more empathy for it. But they can never replace usability testing. Like you shouldn't do these things and then just assume you've got an accessible website because you've done these things. It's really important to actually find people that have impairments and test your site with them. But this is the thing is like if we design with accessibility in mind, it makes things better for everyone. So like, you know, that, that error message, if you'd have made that clear, that would have helped me even though I'm not autistic and I don't have, uh, English is my first language, it would still make it a lot better. Um, yeah, why wouldn't we all want our content to be plain English? Stephen Proctor, who is also sat over there. Uh, if you ever see Stephen talk about content, if you haven't seen him talk about content, do it because it's it's great. But this is a main example of like who's, who, you know, I use websites for their cool animations, pop-ups and under, scroll jack and banner ads and hover effects. Like that is not why people use the internet. Why wouldn't everybody want everything clearer? And this is, uh, so everybody's probably seen this, it comes up in every single accessibility talk that you'll probably ever see, but this is like Microsoft's take on um, a lot of impairments. So uh, impairments aren't always permanent. Like, you know, if you've injured your arm, you can have a temporarily, you can temporarily be impaired. Um, and this means again, like if, if you've designed for these people in mind and you end up with one of these impairments, whether it's temporarily or not, it makes things better for everyone. Uh, this is another exercise where it's a 30 second clip and just in your own head, just try and work out what she's actually talking about in the video. Because this is pretty much what every video without subtitles looks like to a deaf person. So yeah, we've got some plants on a wall there and more plants on a wall. Like, has anyone got any idea what this might be about? But yeah, like, I don't know, does, does anyone have an idea? A what, sorry? A vertical garden. We'll have a look. So again, this is same video, but obviously just got some simple subtitles on. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I am going to tell you what it's about in a minute. But yeah, like... For those of you that can't see the subtitles, basically, um, yeah, in London, they've been trialing putting a load of plants on the side of a building to absorb pollution. And that's basically all it's about. The Middlesex University is running an experiment. They've got a load of stuff on there to bring pollution down, but obviously looking at that. But the thing is as well with like subtitles, like that's every single video is 50-50 with deaf person. Like if they don't have subtitles, they're completely useless. But also, like we were saying before, they help everyone. So you might be on a train in Coach D and you can't have your volume on or whatever, but you can still get the benefit from the video just because it's got subtitles. Um, seems quite self-explanatory, but you'd be amazed at how many videos don't. If you want to create subtitles for your own video, there's like an open source thing you can get called Aggie, uh, Aggie Sub. Um, you can create your own subtitles where you want and you can actually export them to things. Uh, it wasn't a .srt file, which YouTube accepts, so you can upload your video and your subtitles to YouTube. Uh, at the bare minimum, just include a transcript of the video. It could just be a text file or HTML file or whatever, but at least have some form of people being able to actually get what's in the video by reading it or putting it through a screen reader. And it's quite cool to learn how to use your, your well, your own device's screen reader. So um, MacBooks or any Apple device has a thing built in um, called VoiceOver. Uh, there's only about 10 things that you probably need to learn in order to, uh, to blunder your way through with voiceover. Like I only know about four or five commands. If all else fails, you can bring the rotor up and just kind of use that. But for the sake of 10 commands, you can kind of get a lot out of just testing your own code in your own screen reader. Um, screen readers vary like a lot. So voiceover has nuances in it that 
Joe's or NVDA or whatever, they've all got their own little perks. So, you it, you know, if possible, you need to test them in all of the common ones. But at the very least, just run them through Windows and run them through Mac because most people have access to them. Um, Windows, again, you've got a handful of shortcuts. Like, I think there's a couple more with Windows, but on the whole, there's like 10. Uh, the link at the bottom, which I'll tweet out later, um, there's a whole page of these where for every single one, it just gives you um, just the, the shortcuts you'll need to kind of blunder your way through with it instead of having to, because, you know, if you look at the, the keyboard layout for a screen reader, usually it's pretty daunting. There's like a million and one commands, but you only kind of need 10 or so. Um, and the reason why it's cool to test your own code is because a lot of the time, <laughs> this is kind of how I code. So as a designer, I only need a prototype. I don't necessarily have to build, like I don't build production services. So a lot of the time when I'm prototyping, I just cobble stuff together. Um, and that often can mean that my code is awful. Like I do kind of go back to it. We have done accessibility testing on prototypes, but on the whole, you can just, like it, it doesn't, it, it, my code doesn't have to be production ready, basically, so I can just do this. But then we end up with um, we end up in really weird situations where because I've kind of just cobbled stuff together, you can't accessibility test with them. So this is an example from um, one of our DWP services that I'm working on. Uh, and basically in this, you can't, there's some tabs on this screen, but you can't physically get to them unless you're using a mouse. So all I'm doing there is trying to get to that tasks complete tab and no matter which way I go, it's just jumping straight past it. And then um, what I was saying before about like running your code through your own screen reader and stuff, like we found this before we kind of went out and we were like, well, obviously that's an issue. Whereas we would have, we could have just ended up going out to research, putting that in front of somebody and then going, oh, well, they can't access the tab. So we've kind of just blown the research session because now we know it's knackered and we're not going to get a lot out of this because we're not learning how they use the site. We're just learning that we've coded it badly. Um, so Neil, our front-end developer, who's also sat over there, it's a room full of people. Um, Neil helped me to kind of iron it out and actually make it accessible. So now it's the same, it's exactly the same page, visually looks the same. If you use a mouse and it, it behaves exactly the same, but only now you can actually get to it. So yeah, it's exactly the same visually, makes no difference whatsoever. But now if you if your only method of browsing the website is to use a keyboard, like now you can obviously actually get the stuff. Um, and like I was saying before, that just means that you get proper value out of research. You're not having them find things you could have found yourself. You're actually learning whether they can use the website. Um, this is an interesting thing. This is something I worked on recently where um, although you can run it through your own screen readers, there are bugs in them. So this was just a, so this this bar at the top is styled. Uh, it's a, um, what they call description list. And we've got a description list with like a load of stuff in it. And then we've just kind of styled it. But it turns out that if you make something in the description list, inline or inline block, for some reason, it breaks voiceover in Safari. It's fine in Chrome, but in Safari, it thinks there's only one thing in the list. Key details, content information, description list, one item. So yeah, there's actually like a load of stuff in there and it will read them out if you tab through them manually, but it just means that's kind of broke. Oh, it's still going, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing again. So like exactly the same, it's a description list, but we've had to restyle it. So instead of making things in line block or whatever, we've had to use floats and it was a, bit more of a chew on, but visually it looks exactly the same. Um, but this time around, it actually... Description list, six items. Name, Jane Doe, national insurance Yeah, number. it's literally just gonna go through all of them, but uh, yeah, it's the same thing again as like, just running it through voiceover and stuff. Um, it's, it's gonna have bugs in it and you can kind of find them out as well and restyle your stuff. Um, and yeah, I, this is the takeaway thing is that nobody expects you to get accessibility perfect, um, but just kind of like have a bit more empathy for it and try a little bit harder when you're designing these things to think about other people. Uh, and that is all from me.
Uh, these are the links from them things. Like I said, the glasses are knocking about if anyone wants to turn to them. Uh, and I'll tweet all these links out later for anyone that, that sort of wants them. But that is me.